Okay, I think I'm part of the 21st century now, um, and I will begin this lecture. Uh, my name is Neil Seldman. I work with the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. I'm part of the Waste to Wealth team uh, here in our Washington, D.C. office. Uh, the Institute has offices in D.C., uh, Minneapolis, and uh, Portland, Maine. Um, we are 40 years old. We uh, started off as a community organization in the Adams Morgan neighborhood of Washington, D.C., and uh, that was in 1974. By around 1980, we started working uh, in cities across the country. Uh, we only work in the United States. Um, this lecture is being uh, conducted uh, for the Illinois uh, Recyclers Association. I'm working with Wynn Coplia, uh, who is uh, working on this project uh, for uh, college level and junior college level uh, educational programs. Um, the Institute provides technical assistance uh, to cities, businesses, uh, government agencies uh, in areas of sustainability. Um, uh, waste is one of the issues, obviously, uh, where I work. Uh, we have programs in decentralized energy, uh, broadband communications, uh, independent uh, business networks uh, across the U.S. Um, this uh, discussion is focused on solid waste management um, and the uh, recent developments uh, in the field and uh, it, the purpose is to introduce students to key issues and some key insights uh, that have been gleaned by a great many uh, grassroots recyclers, business people, entrepreneurs, and progressive government uh, officials, both elected and appointed. Um, so, let me start by saying that the solid waste sector, the municipal solid waste sector in the United States, um, is uh, roughly a $70 billion sector. That's a rough estimate. Uh, it's very hard to get an accurate estimate. And those numbers do not include certain sections that a lot of people would consider solid waste. Uh, certainly construction and demolition debris, called C&D. Uh, for some reason, the EPA does not define that as part of municipal solid waste. Uh, however, it is a significant part of municipal solid waste, uh, a, a part that cities and uh, private companies have to deal with. To give you a sense of the dimensions, there are roughly 250-260 million tons of municipal solid waste generated a year uh, in our country and the uh, number for construction and demolition waste is roughly 230 uh, million tons per year. So we're talking about 500 million tons. Um, my estimate is that the United States uh, is recovering uh, perhaps 45 percent of that material. Uh, the EPA has an official figure of 35 percent of municipal solid waste. If you add uh, the considerable recycling of construction and demolition uh, waste, uh, we probably are up at the 45 percent level. Um, municipal solid waste does not include sewage waste, which is, uh, which is called biosolids, uh, and um, uh, that in some cities they combine composting, uh, sewage, and um, uh, food scrap waste. Uh, however, uh, technically speaking, uh, this is uh, sewage sludge is not considered uh, solid waste. However, it gets complicated because cities like San Francisco uh, release information that they're recycling at about the 80% level, uh, and that's accurate, but you have to know that they're including C and D, and they're including sewage sludge uh, that is being repurposed. So um, that's a great number for the city of San Francisco, but you have to understand what they're including in their statistics. And in other cities uh, that do not include C and D uh, and sewage in their recycling level, uh, those uh, recycling levels are lower, uh, but they could be doing just as much uh, work, just as, as much good work uh, in municipal solid waste diversion. Um, the um, last 45 years in solid waste management has seen a literal revolution of attitudes, practice, and economics. Um, the uh, prior to let's say the 1970s, uh, we had a paradigm of uh, bury or burn uh, municipal solid waste, and starting in the 70s, a grassroots movement uh, grew up. A grassroots recycling movement uh, grew up slowly but surely, 
uh, recycling started uh, by grassroots citizens when recycling was not economically viable, but by around the 1990s it became economically viable. And then we had a very interesting uh, situation where infrastructure has been built uh, and implemented uh, assuming that the end of the line was a landfill or an incinerator and here come a group of people who are setting up recycling businesses uh, linking up with the existing scrap industries and a whole new sector had emerged to give you an idea oh, around 1970 maybe five percent at most ten percent of municipal solid waste had been recycling recycled uh, right now we're officially at 35 percent uh, I think it's higher than that if you include C and D. The bottom line is that over a hundred million tons of, uh, of recycled materials are being returned to industry and agriculture every year in the United States. Um, and um, this is important to know because now uh, we're not only talking economics, but we're talking a pretty big impact on uh, climate change and other environmental issues, clean water, clean air, etc. Um, the replacement uh, paradigm uh, after Barry and Byrne was something called integrated solid waste management. It's an interesting term. It was originated uh, by researchers at the uh, World Bank, uh, Mr. Gunnarsson, and also uh, at the same time Barry Commoner working in uh, the Center for Biology up in Queens. And they meant by the term integrated solid waste management, this we're talking in the early 1980s, that solid waste management had to be implemented uh, in a way that integrates with a community's uh, uh, economics, its environment, its culture, and traditions. Um, very quickly after the term was introduced, it was hijacked, if you will, uh, by the incineration industry and, and landfill industry and um, integrated resource recovery uh, meant a little bit of recycling, a little bit of composting, a little bit of in, uh, landfilling, and a little bit of incineration. Uh, by 1995, the propaganda promoting integrated resource recovery as the new paradigm was very frustrating to the grassroots movement uh, that wanted recycling, uh, and uh, a new uh, concept was introduced uh, in the United States by the Grassroots Recycling Network in 1995, and that was a concept called Zero Waste. Uh, the concept originated in New Zealand and Australia, uh, was brought back to the United States by uh, primarily uh, Urban Orr, Dan Knapp, Dr. Dan Knapp at Urban Orr, who was uh, working in Australia at the time. And the, the term has caught on. There are many, many zero waste communities in the United States and certainly around the world. And very briefly, the, uh, the, uh, the definition means that um, we will reduce uh, the amount of materials going to landfill and incineration by 90% or more uh, to achieve what we call zero waste. Uh, here again, industry has tried to complicate things and uh, quite literally befuddle people's minds by coming up with a strategy called zero waste to landfill, meaning uh, that they will send everything to an incinerator, which is not the original meaning of zero waste, which had no room for landfill uh, incineration and only 10% uh, or less going to landfill. Um, the, uh, the battle has been raging for quite some time. Um, in the 80s and 90s, uh, 300 uh, incinerators were canceled, and that's because the fledgling recycling movement uh, was joined by the anti-incineration movement, which was ad hoc people, people who had never thought of themselves as citizen organizers, but were reacting to the, uh, the, uh, the planned emissions and the actual costs of these incinerators, which were hundreds of millions of dollars, and they proved to be the most polluting and the most costly way of getting rid of your, 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 your municipal waste. The irony is that zero waste to landfill is a joke by definition because if you have an incinerator you must have a landfill for the ash and the bypass waste. So um, we at the Institute and many of our colleagues across the country uh, promote zero waste as recycling and economic development. Uh, we look at incineration and landfilling as a destruction of raw materials. Um, the zero waste paradigm is moving forward. Uh, it's taken over in Italy, uh, France, which has been burning 50% of its garbage for the last who knows how many years, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, is now moving away from incineration 
and there are many other uh, 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 factors going on around the world which are uh, which are raising the uh, consciousness of, and the practical activity of groups and small businesses across the world. Um, there's an excellent organization called the Zero Waste International Alliance, uh, which uh, is very uh, good for getting definitions, uh, lists of zero waste communities, and many other uh, excellent uh, resources uh, on that webpage. I'll be mentioning some other excellent sources of information toward the end of uh, of uh, this uh, this lecture. Uh, one last thing to say about um, uh, this conflict between uh, burying and burning and recycling and composting and reuse um, is that um, there's been very little coverage of this movement. Uh, it's a very self-conscious movement, but the traditional press, the trade journals, have really not focused on it. Um, you can get bits and pieces of uh, the story of what, what has been going on in the last 30 or 40 years um, from reading BioCycle magazine, which is a great resource. Uh, but the, the, the actual tensions, the debates, uh, the, the groups involved uh, have not been well documented. The Institute has tried to document this. Um, I did a piece uh, called uh, Recycling in the United States um, uh, since World War II. Uh, that was in the Wiley Encyclopedia for uh, Environment, Energy, and Technology in 1995, published in New York City. And then uh, Brenda Platt and I um, did a, 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 a book uh, booklet called Wasting in the U.S. 2000, which was published in 2000 by the Grassroots Recycling Network, which brings the, brought the 1995 article up to date. And um, one other uh, important document that may help people, um, uh, Brenda Platt also did a whole series of books on beyond 25% uh, recycling, beyond 40% uh, recycling, and beyond 50% recycling, um, all of which are, include case studies of cities, small towns, and rural areas that have actually performed uh, high levels of recycling, creating jobs, and creating a flow of raw materials to agriculture and industry. Um, with that background in the United States, um, let me just say uh, that the recycling movement has been incredibly successful, over 300 incinerators uh, 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 defeated by citizen and small business action, and uh, most recently uh, there was a hiatus from 1995 till around 2010 when no incineration, incinerators were proposed or planned. We have in the United States one uh, under construction now, mainly because of, I believe, failure of uh, organizing strategies that have worked in other places, but uh, dozens have already been defeated in this second round of uh, pushing for incineration across the United States, and I accept, uh, expect the same uh, results as in the 80s and 90s, where maybe 30 got built, 300 uh, were, were, uh, were defeated. So, what is the world setting uh, for uh, this, uh, this dilemma uh, of what to do with solid waste management in the United States. It's a very important world setting. Uh, the American economy is not autonomous. Uh, we don't live in a shell. Uh, we live in the real world. And in the real world, we have seven, now have seven billion people um, and rising. Uh, and as you know, every time there's a new person, there's need for new water, new food, uh, and so on, resources uh, for life. And so seven billion people is, is uh, quite a burden on the planet. Um, the second part of the burden is that roughly half of these seven billion people, half of us, uh, primarily uh, in Asia and uh, Latin America, are now um, consuming at the same rates that uh, Europe and the United States and Canada have been consuming uh, for the past 30, 40 years, which means that each individual uh, that comes onto the earth is going to be consuming more uh, of all raw materials than previously. Um, the final uh, uh, tripod of <laughs> uh, the peg of this uh, triple dilemma is that the resources we need for feeding people, for being productive, creating goods, um, are getting harder and harder to come by. Um, after 200 years of industrial extraction of all kinds, uh, we um, have to go a mile below the Gulf of Mexico to get oil. We have to frack uh, throughout the United States. Uh, our soils are worn out. Our waterways are contaminated. Uh, the ocean itself is contaminated. 
and there are some excellent resources on all of these uh, aspects of what we're facing. Um, so the easy to get materials are more and more costly to get and the, the process of getting these materials is more and more dangerous to humans and the environment. Therefore, recycling, reuse, uh, composting um, are the cheapest way to get raw materials back to industry and agriculture uh, because they're readily available. The bottom line is, is that it's much simpler to mine our waste stream for aluminum, for copper, for uh, paper, etc., for food, for composting, uh, than any other way to get these raw materials. Uh, the other incredibly important thing about recycling is that by its nature it's decentralized. As you know, uh, most of all of our industries uh, are um, dominated by three, four, five corporations. Uh, mon monopolies are popping up everywhere. Um, and there are four traditional uh, sectors of the economy that don't like recycling. Uh, Wall Street doesn't like recycling because it, it eliminates the need for landfills uh, and incinerators which need bonds uh, which keeps Wall Street in business. Uh, the virgin materials uh, industry doesn't like uh, recycling because they like to have their monopoly or oligopoly on uh, paper, metal, whatever material we're talking about, and they don't like competition from 10,000 cities and counties. Uh, because they know that recycled materials are just as good as virgin materials. In fact, uh, they're, they're better because they have embodied energy, labor, and the extraction pollution has already been paid. Uh, then, of course, there are the waste haulers who are making a fortune, 30-40% return on landfilling and incineration and hauling, uh, and they don't like the idea that recycling can be carried out with smaller trucks, smaller companies, and, uh, and take away their market share. Uh, this is why many of these companies are buying up composting uh, companies and uh, electronic recycling companies, etc. And the fourth uh, uh, part of our culture and economy that dislike recycling are conservative pundits uh, who believe that only corporations have the right to change the laws and make new rules, and they resent the fact that citizens are getting together and changing these rules. They see uh, recycling as a communist plot because people are told that they have to recycle. Uh, my response is that if a society can tell you to how many can tell you how many wives or husbands you can have, they certainly can tell you how to take out the garbage. Uh, but uh, these are very serious issues uh, in terms of political theory. Uh, I ironically, um, it turns out that the recyclers are the most conservative people in our society. They literally want to conserve things and they want to improve things as they conserve things. And this is a very interesting juxtaposition because uh, the founder of modern political theory, uh, Edmund Burke, uh, he had many uh, apt phrases, uh, including one, uh, you want to move forward with one eye on the past and one eye on the future. Another great expression of his uh, political philosophy was um, citizens want their elected officials to do today what they will have wanted them to do 10 years hence. And when you look at all the citizen opposition to incinerators based on finances, and you see what happens when these things get built, uh, you realize that the citizens were actually correct and they were the conservatives. You could look at Montgomery County, Maryland, where they have a, an operating incinerator, uh, but in the past 20 years they paid over $100 million more to run that facility than they would have with recycling, composting, and landfill. So, given that background, um, what uh, has been the reaction in the United States uh, to, uh, the, uh, uh, to this phenomenon of uh, recycling grassroots movements uh, uh, by the, uh, the uh, large uh, groups in our society, the corporations, the large environmental groups? Well, they're confused by it. They're confused by it because the recycling, the grassroots recyclers um, uh, will not be satisfied. They won't be satisfied until we get to zero waste. And that is why you see constantly from e EPA, uh, from large corporations, and even some from some very large environmental groups, there's always the willingness to compromise to stop the grassroots from being uh, so aggressive in banning plastic bags, banning polystyrene, uh, excuse me, polystyrene uh, food service containers, uh, etc. 
Uh, and this, this is the, the, the nub of it. Uh, the nub of it is that uh, uh, corporations want to dominate and citizens want stability and they want common sense solutions and we're not getting those from uh, the larger institutions in our society. Um, as I said before, 300 incinerators were um, uh, eliminated by citizen protest in the 80s and 90s. Uh, since uh, uh, 2010, there's another wave of maybe 150 proposed incinerators. Uh, one is being built, the others are all being, uh, all being um, uh, challenged by citizens and small business groups. Um, and the key to this, uh, to this fight, this battle, is that in the United States, at uh, the local level, is where you find total authority for solid waste management. Certainly there are some federal and state rules, but the conduct of solid waste management, collection, processing, disposal, etc., uh, all is at the local level. And at the local level, citizens have a fighting chance to impact uh, solid waste management decisions, and that's what we've been doing for the past 40 years. Um, uh, citizens have asserted themselves by creating new rules that everyone has to play by. Uh, mandatory recycling uh, for both businesses and households. Uh, minimum content legislation was passed. Uh, this is uh, legislation that requires uh, companies, if they want to sell their product in a particular state, the, uh, the product has to have a minimum amount of recycled content in it. This, of course, shores up the markets for recycled paper. Um, uh, bans of, of, of certain uh, products that are hard to recycle and bad for the, for the environment and the public, uh, I've mentioned. Um, there's the, the scheme for pay-as-you-throw. 7,000 cities in the United States have adopted pay-as-you-throw, which means you pay for your garbage services based on how much garbage you put out, uh, and you pay nothing or a very little amount for your recyclables. Uh, this, of course, uses economic incentives uh, to drive people to uh, use the recycled bin, not the garbage bin. And if you look around in many uh, large cities, you'll see that the garbage bins, the size of the garbage bins are shrinking, and the size of the compost bins and recycling bins are expanding. Uh, and this is an indication of what we like to call um, a rule of thumb, which is that the wasting industry is a sunset industry, and recycling, composting, and reuse uh, comprise a sunrise industry. And this is critical uh, because of uh, the need for jobs and the need for lowering cost of management in our cities. When it comes to jobs, you will see from the uh, graphic uh, that will be provided um, that reuse uh, re uh, uh, returns the highest number of jobs, uh, composting and um, uh, recycling, the processing of those materials create four, uh, five to ten times as many jobs uh, as incineration. Uh, and the uh, unit of measure we like to um, use at the Institute, uh, based on uh, over a hundred surveys of businesses, is that uh, for every hundred, uh, for every ten thousand tons of raw material you landfill or uh, incinerate, you create one job. Uh, for every uh, 10,000 tons where you process, you create five to 10 jobs. And then as that processed material moves out to industry and agriculture, you create hundreds of jobs, as you can see uh, on the chart. Uh, Brenda Platt just completed a study uh, showing that if all the municipal, uh, all the organic material in the waste stream in the state of Maryland uh, would to be composted, 1,400 jobs would be created, and those uh, most of those jobs would be paying between 14 and 19 dollars an hour. Uh, when it comes to reuse, uh, there's a wonderful program from the uh, St. Vincent de Paul, Lane County, Oregon. Uh, they help community groups set up uh, uh, reuse uh, enterprises, uh, and uh, when they set up a business. Uh, they won't uh, move forward unless the business will pay $14 an hour plus health insurance. So creating uh, um, uh, uh, decent paying jobs with health insurance is a, one of the many benefits of uh, moving into recycling and composting from uh, uh, burning and burying. Um, one, uh, uh, two, rather, uh, several other uh, new rules that citizens have pushed, of course, the bottle bills in 10 states. Um, are the result of citizen uh, action. Um, the take back of hazardous materials, uh, mercury switches, paints, 
uh, and other uh, dangerous materials is happening again as a result of uh, grassroots pressure. And finally, uh, the resource recovery parks. These are industrial parks created by cities and states exclusively for recycling, reuse, and composting companies. Um, I refer to these, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit later, as the uh, pot of gold at the end of the recycling and composting rainbow, because when you take your raw materials from your waste stream and process them, you're adding value locally to your local economy, and you're creating jobs. But when you, you use those raw materials to make an end product, uh, then you're really escalating the number of jobs and the economic value you're creating. Uh, to give you a sense of this, uh, the St. Vincent de Paul folks that I mentioned earlier, since the 2008-9 uh, recession depression, uh, they have added over 100 jobs and raised wages. Um, so uh, it's very clear uh, that these are permanent, stable jobs in our economy. Um, the overall picture of the recycling sector, um, it, uh, gross sales are roughly about $240 billion a year. Uh, 65,000 companies and 10,000 government programs are operating, and over 1 million workers uh, have been uh, provided jobs through recycling. And this is at the 35% uh, level of recycling, according to EPA, which means that these numbers can easily be doubled. And in fact, key cities across the country are at 70% uh, diversion through recycling, composting, and reuse. Uh, if they're not at it exactly, they're at 68, 67 percent, uh, and we're talking about uh, uh, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Portland, Oregon, excuse, yeah, Portland, Oregon, Seattle, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, San Diego County, etc.